Today's reading is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 24. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable, suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, Now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning to worship and fellowship. Thank you for this church family. Thank you for Pastor Jason and the way that you use him to lead this church. Please give us receptive hearts and minds for what you will teach us through him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Shelley. So yeah, if you haven't turned there yet, turn to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 18. We're going to be there this morning. We're going to be there again next week as well. Uh, if you haven't turned there, turn there now. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the chair underneath you or, or somewhere in one of those chairs right in front of you there. And you're welcome to grab that and use that today. If you don't own a Bible, you're welcome to take that home as our gift to you. Uh, so while you're finishing up turning there, uh, I do want to just give a word and of thanks to the men and women that serve in our worship team. Man, it's such a blessing to have them leading in worship every week and the men and women that serve in the background and our audiovisual. And I would like to encourage you, if you're part of this church and you're looking for a way to serve, we always can use more help, uh, both in the worship team, you can see Pastor Josh, but also in all the things that happen now with our streaming and with our cameras and with uh, sound. And so if you're interested at all in helping and, and uh, maybe you've done this before or you're willing to learn, uh, we, can, we can teach you, okay? So uh, see Pastor Josh or see me and we'll get you involved. Um, so Genesis chapter 2, uh, this is the second of our third week in this short series titled The Wrong Side of History. The pull from that title is that, that very threat that all sides make about who they're pretty sure is going to be on the wrong side of history. And what we're understanding is that when Christ returns, when the sky rolls back like a cloud, um, we kind of think like, God, are you going to be on our side or are you going to be on their side? That's not how that works. That's not how it works for anybody. The question is going to be, are you on his side? And what if you can know what it means to be on the side of God, okay? And so we don't use the wrong side of history as a threat, and we're not threatened by that from other folks. We understand from Scripture. And I would encourage you uh, to check out last week if you missed it. Uh, we're breaking away from our normal pattern. Instead, instead of teaching through a book or an extended text, and in two weeks, we'll start our new book study in Colossians, talking about the supremacy of Christ. But this short series, this three weeks, is topical. And the goal here is to make clear and concise statements from Scripture, statements that, culturally speaking, are controversial or even sometimes considered hate speech, but that the Bible clearly teaches. Because Jesus said that, that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so we believe that. We believe what Jesus says. We believe that the truth will set us free. So what does the Bible have to say about sexuality? What does the Bible have to say about gender? And about marriage. And we began last week and we're going to continue uh, this week and going into next week. To review though, we talked about last week how the Bible clearly states in multiple places all throughout that homosexuality is a sin. In fact, the Bible condemns all sexual activity outside of marriage. And then we talked about the good news of the gospel is that Jesus died for sexual sinners of all stripes. Okay, that's the good news of the gospel. That is gospel hope. Something that cannot be emphasized enough through this series is that God is not anti-sex, okay? So sex was God's idea, all right? He is not anti-sex. It was his idea. He is the designer and the creator of it. 
Why are there so many warnings and prohibitions? Because there are so many ways from the very beginning of creation or, or when, when, when sin happened at the fall, there's so many ways that we are constantly just driving off the road. But God is not a big old meanie. God is not a cosmic killjoy. We are meant to enjoy the gift of sex, one man, one woman, within the covenant of marriage. He specifically designed it that way. It was all his idea. All right? That's how that works. The entire book of Song of Solomon, I wasn't allowed to read it until I was like 15, the entire book of Song of Solomon discreetly but definitely celebrates the husband and wife relationship. The entire book does. God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. This was all his idea. Hebrews says that the marriage bed is held in honor. God is not anti-sex. It is his creation, it is his design, it is his good gift, and when we celebrate it in the way that he has gifted it to us, in the way that he intends, we flourish. Likewise, to the contrary, when we think we know better, and we've been thinking we know better since like the very beginning, and we do things that he expressly forbids, we suffer tremendously. I was asked this week a great question. Uh, along the lines of like, like the current monkeypox outbreak, which is uh, almost completely transmitted uh, through like homosexual sex and homosexual orgy, orgies. And like uh, then like uh, beyond monkeypox to like AIDS and, and, re- and then, you know, other sexually transmitted diseases, if those are like the direct judgment of God. And I think that you have to be careful um, declaring something God's judgment because in, in the Bible when that, when that happened, that was f- uh, preceded by like a direct word from God. So I think you have to be very careful in declaring those things. It could be, but what I do know is that in the New Testament, the Bible tells us, like Paul's like, look, like sex is God's idea. It's supposed to be enjoyed in marriage between one man and one woman. And then Paul also tells us that the body isn't meant for immorality. Like not in a bad way, but it's not designed for it. Is that God didn't create us for it. It's not meant for immorality. And so we understand when he talks about immorality there, he is talking about all type of sexual activity outside of marriage between one man and one woman. So it wasn't designed, the body wasn't designed for sex outside of monogamous marriage. And so what these diseases are certainly an indicator of is our bodies breaking down because we're consuming something in a way that we're not designed to consume it. So at the very least, we can understand that, right? That, that, and so when God like, puts a prohibition on something, it's because he's our designer, he's our creator. He, he knows what you were created for and what you were created to do and how you were created to live. And so we have to trust him with that. And so today I want to give a few more clear statements from Scripture, and then I also want to give a way forward, Uh, because quite frankly, I think that if we're all honest, many of us are behaving and struggling, and and the way we live and talk and interact with other people who don't see things our way is at best not working, and at worst, it's unacceptable. And so we've got to talk about like a, a, a good way forward. So let me give you two more clear statements from Scripture, and then we'll talk a little bit about a way forward today. And then next week, we're going to talk more about trans identity from Scripture and also just a word from Scripture about those who feel like they don't, they don't fit in, okay? So here's the, the next clear, concise statement from Scripture. God designed marriage for one man and one woman. Okay? God designed marriage for one man and one woman. Now look, right from the top, People will jump on that statement sometimes in good faith and sometimes in bad faith. You sure about that? Like how many wives did Abraham have? What about Jacob? How many wives did he have? What about King David? What about Solomon? Didn't he have somewhere around a thousand wives? And so all of these people just mentioned here are major players in scripture and major players in Israel's history. So you sure about that, that God designed marriage for that? Because I see all these other examples, and they seem to be given a pass in what they do. And the answer is, yes, I'm sure about it, without a doubt. So the text that Shelley read, we'll read it again. Look at verse 18. Let's go through it again, okay? We're going to look at it again next week, too. The Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. 
So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And when he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Now remember, whenever you read scripture, like you learn new things, because up until like two weeks ago, I thought it was, we got the word woman from the first time Adam saw Eve, and he was like, whoa, man, you know? But that's not how that works, and you learn something new every week, okay? Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father, and by the way, there's a lot here. We're going to talk more about it next week, how that, that, that women are not just a byproduct or an afterthought, how like God's intention is here is that creation wasn't complete until there was this male-female complementarity, right? That, that creation wasn't finished. We'll talk about that next week. Verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, they'll become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So like page two of the Bible, okay? Part of the creation order established that marriage is between one man and one woman. This design by God is confirmed again in many places in Scripture, in the Old and New Testament, but also again by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. We'll put that on the screen for you. He answered, uh, verse 4 there, He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So here Jesus is confirming what we read in the Old Testament. We talked about last week how there are, well that was hot there, are we okay? We talked about last week how um, there are some people that like, try to argue like, we only follow the words of Jesus, okay? And they consider themselves red, red letter Christians. And we talked last week about how that's a faulty understanding of scripture. But even if you want to go that route, here is Jesus clearly defining what marriage is and isn't. And here is Jesus clearly defining that there are two genders. We talked last week, we won't go back into it, about the whole idea about, well, he wouldn't have known all the progress we could make. It's a total, total ignorant stance on what Greco-Roman culture was like, and every type of sexual proclivity and opportunity was available at that time. Okay, so here's Jesus clearly de defining one man, one woman, two genders, male and female. It's established right at the beginning of cre creation. It's reconfirmed by Jesus, and there are many other places in the Bible. Now, in between Genesis and Matthew, especially in other places, but especially in the Old Testament, which is often written in narrative form. So much of the Old Testament is storytelling. It's written in a narrative style. So we have example after example of men and sometimes women who think they know better. Like, this is God's design for marriage, and then like right after that, everybody's like, yeah, I think I'm going to do my own thing. What could go wrong? You know, like, I think that's what I'm going to do. And it's like, hey, I'm going to marry a bunch of women. I'm going to be like everyone else around me, by the way. God was calling them to something that was different than the rest of the culture. I want to be like the rest of the culture, so I'm going to marry a bunch of women. And you have some women in Scripture saying, maybe it's best if my husband has more wives. And while I realize that that would be wild to most of us, it was a way to build nations and power and family and empires. And so you see this clear statement from Scripture that God designed marriage for one man and one woman. We have to understand that it has always been controversial. Always. It was con it's controversial now primarily because it excludes same-sex partners as a valid form of marriage. It's controversial in ancient times because it excludes polygamy, which everyone was doing. Well, so what about all those stories of Old Testament patriarchs? Some of them who described as men after God's own heart, marrying many wives. And as I said, the way the Old Testament is recorded, much of it is narrative. It's story form. And if you're a reader, you understand that good stories don't stop with comments that say, this was a bad decision. This was a dumb decision. They did not obey God here. Sometimes you see that in, in the Old Testament, but a lot of times you don't. In great storytelling, you see the consequences of those decisions through the telling of the story. That's what you see. And so you have to understand in the Old Testament that much of it's storytelling. And we're supposed to read what God said, what they did in spite of what God said, and how it worked out for everyone. 
And so to the people that say the Bible contradicts itself and looks the other way when one of their favorite men marries a lot of women, I would simply ask, have you read any of the stories? Like, have you read any of them? In every single instance, disastrous consequences for them denying God's design for marriage. What happens when Abraham takes multiple wives? He's goaded on by his wife Sarah, by the way because God had promised them a child and was going to make this great nation, right? But she's barren. She hasn't had a kid, and the promise was years ago. Still hasn't happened. So she gives Hagar to Abraham to be his wife. And so Isaac is eventually born of Sarah, but Ishmael's born from Hagar. And so they're born from two separate women. Both moms believe their child is the child of the promise. Both children believe they are the child of the promise. There is a rift in Middle Eastern culture that carries on to this day. This day. We understand in Scripture, talk about the God of Abraham and Isaac. But a Muslim would say the God of Abraham and Ishmael. You know they would say that? So there is fallout to this day from Abraham being like, eh, God's not doing what I thought he was going to do. I think I'm going to go my own way on this. If this massive fallout from the disobedience of Abraham and Sarah in regards to marriage tried to make something happen. What about Jacob? The entire story of Joseph's betrayal by his brothers centers around the fact that he is the favorite son from the favorite wife. The, the, the source of the fallout and the pain and the hate is because of polygamy. Because Jacob's like, eh, I know what God said, but I, I think I'm going to do my own thing. Gershom's over there. He's got a bunch of wives. It's looking good for him. Let, let's go ahead and do what he does. Joseph's brothers hated him because he was from the favorite wife and he was the favorite son. It's almost entirely the result of the polygamy that God forbade. But Jacob decided he wanted to do it anyways. One of David's sons from a less favored wife takes the kingdom from him for a while, rapes his half-sister. Great shame and heartache placed on the family of David and the entire kingdom of Israel. Great fallout from polygamy. Because even King David's like, yeah, you know, I'm a man after God's own heart, but this time I'm going to do what my heart wants to do. I'm going to be like all the other kings around me. All these kings around me, they all got a bunch of wives. And it's a great way to like negotiate and get territory. And so I'm going to do what everybody else does. So you see this great fallout. And then, I mean, you get to King Solomon, who had upwards of a thousand wives, and this dude, man, like, like any husband can appreciate the difficulty of asking your one wife, honey, where should we eat tonight? Like, I, like how would you get a thousand wives to agree on where you're going to eat tonight? Uh, you know, it's beyond me, the, like the amount of Kohl's cash they would have to have on hand during tax-free back-to-school weekend. His Starbucks bill alone would be a daily punishment for him. Can you imagine being behind that family in the line? Like, like 174 vanilla lattes with one pump and no whip, right? Like, that's what they would do. But, but seriously, we're told that he married many foreign wives. And this man, who was perhaps the wisest to ever live, who was granted this great wisdom as a grace from God, great shame on his life is at the end of his life, his heart was turned from the one true God by all of his foreign wives. The issue there is not that they're foreigners. The issue is there by being foreign is that they worshiped other gods than the one true God. And he takes a thousand of them because it made wisdom and it made sense. It would help build the kingdom. It's not the way God wanted the kingdom built, but Solomon's like, I'm going to do my own thing anyways. And his heart is ultimately in his old age turned away from the one true God to his great shame to the worship of idols. What about all of the polygamous marriages in the Bible? What about them? Like, line them all up. Line them all up. Show me one where you can say, hey, it worked out well for those guys. It doesn't. Never. In every instance, you see terrible consequences from men and women of faith believing that they know better than God. Every instance. So you have God clearly declaring, this is how I designed marriage to work between one man and one woman. Then you have multiple examples in the Bible of people, even people of faith saying, I think I know better. And you have the Bible recording then the chaos and the fallout and the heartache and the heartbreak and the jealousy and the envy. A wife should be jealous if her husband has another wife. That's not sin. You have all of this chaos. It's everywhere. 
A child should be jealous for their parents' attention from another child, from another marriage. God designed marriage for one man and one woman. And so the question is, do I believe God? Do I trust him? Do I trust his design? And every time I sin, regardless of whatever the sin is, every time I sin, I am saying, no, I don't believe God. I don't believe him in this area. I believe he's right in these other things, but this one area, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Every time I sin, I choose to believe the lies of the devil, the lies of my own desires over the promises of God. Every time I sin, it's because I love something else more than God, and I think I know God better than God does. And yet, mercifully, God is there waiting to reconcile us through his son Jesus. What a merciful and long-suffering God he is. So that's the first statement. God designed marriage for one man and one woman. And here's the second thing I want to clearly state today. That our desires, as we experience them, are not natural. Okay? Our desires, as we experience them, are not natural. So one of the strongest and most emotional argument made, arguments made, especially for people who pursue same-sex desires or pursue trans ideology, is that God made me this way. That I feel this deeply, and God made me this way. I've liked other boys for as long as I can remember. I've liked other girls for as long as I can remember. I have felt like I was a, a woman trapped in a male body for as long as I can remember. I'm telling you, I was born this way. God made me gay, and it's not a mistake. Well, how do you respond to that? He would want me to be happy. How do you respond to that? And this is what we need to understand. We need to have a theology of what sin does to all of creation. God made you, and God made me, but sin has corrupted you, and sin has corrupted me. Sin has corrupted all of us, and it's corrupted even our desires. So sin has touched and twisted every single one of us. So every single one of us have desires that feel natural, that are not natural, that are not as God intends. So I'll throw you some examples up on, on, scripture, uh, on the screen from Scripture about how sin affects all of us. Romans chapter 3, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all because all sinned. 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So what the Bible clearly teaches over and over again is that uh, sin has touched every single one of us. And it touches every part of creation. All of creation is not as it should be and not what it will be when Christ returns and makes all things new. We talked about this in Romans chapter 8. Literal creation, the universe, is groaning under the weight of sin. Some of it's our fault, some of it's other people's fault. Some of it's stuff that none of us had anything to do with, but somebody else did generations ago. We are all groaning under the weight of sin, all of us. And so because of that, every part of us, sin touches every part of creation, it touches every part of us, and sin touches our desires. So some of our desires that come naturally that feel natural are due to the corruption of sin and contrary to God's design. This is so common that the Bible warns us about it a lot. I'll just stop here for a second and give you a quick example. We helped years ago working with somebody, well-to-do lady, just struggled continuously with stealing. As long as I can remember, Jason, I've just felt this urge to steal. Doesn't need to, doesn't need to to survive, thriving, and dealing with like a shoplifting on a record. And as long, I can't describe it, but as long as I can remember, I've had this urge to do this, even though I don't need it. That is an example of what every one of us deals with. Every single one of us have desires that are not desires that God intends. They are desires that are corrupted by the sin nature within us. This is so common, this is so important, right? They feel natural and it's due to the corruption of sin and contrary to God's design. The Bible warns us about just simply giving in to our feelings. 
repeatedly about just simply following our heart without any, uh, you know, acknowledge that maybe our heart can lead us away. Because the culture says, trust your heart, follow it. It will never lead you astray. Just to use an extreme example, there are lots of people in prison right now who trusted their heart. Do you understand that? And every one of us could get up here and talk for the next two hours and share examples about the time we followed our heart and did something really stupid and really bad. And I'm just using extreme examples to show you that all of us have feelings that feel natural, that come easy, that are still contrary to God's intention for us. This is what the Bible says. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17. Matthew 15. Out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder and adultery and sexual immorality and theft and false, and wit a false witness and slander. Proverbs 28, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be de delivered. What these verses just give us a tasting of in Scripture is the warning to be careful that if you just simply follow your desires in your heart, your heart has an incredible ability to convince you to do something you know you shouldn't do. And we can all testify to that. So because sin has touched every single one of us, because sin has corrupted even our desires, there are desires that every one of us feels deeply that are not what God intended. They feel natural, and they are natural to our sin nature, but they are not natural desires that God created for us to enjoy. So each and, one of us, each and every one of us have desires that feel natural, that come easy, and are completely contrary to the plan of God and God's will. So how do you know? Well, the answer is that the ultimate guide is not my feelings. The ultimate guide is not my desires. The ultimate guide is the word of God. And so when my feelings and my desires come into conflict with the clear teaching of Scripture, it is my feelings and my desires that need to change. And whether that's homosexuality, whether that's sexual immorality, whether that's living with your girlfriend, whether that's stealing, skimming off the top from your company, whatever it is. Our nature, as one writer says, as we experience it, is not natural. So we have to understand that and come to grips with that. God made me, but sin has corrupted me. And we have to think of sin as like this outside agent that because of our own choices and choices of others, it's been introduced and it's tainted and twisted and scarred everything. And one of those unnatural desires that feels natural is same-sex attraction. The Bible in Romans 1 calls it contrary to nature. And yet folks would tell you that it feels very natural. They've maybe experienced it as long as they can remember. But it is contrary to God's design. If you talk to someone with those desires, they'll explain how long they've had them, how natural it feels. And I just want to point out how we understand this in other areas, though, that our feelings don't triumph everything. And how we have this illogical approach to certain things. Be true to yourself sounds really good. And school's about to start, and that'll be like a big push. Everybody be true to yourself. And there's this current country song on the radio the other day. I believe that you love whoever you love. Ain't nothing to be ashamed of. Um, you guys want me to sing that again for you? I can do it again. Okay. Nobody actually believes that. Nobody actually believes that. You only believe that in certain culturally approved scenarios. That dude does not believe that a pedophile loves who he loves. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Do you understand that? And so, well, well how do we decide what's right and wrong? Well, not the culture. Scripture. Right? If we let culture decide, then even uh, interracial marriages are wrong at times in history. And we know that's absolutely ridiculous. Okay? There's nothing in Scripture about that at all, but the culture said so for a long time. The culture doesn't decide, I believe who you love, who you love. Nobody believes that. Nobody does. You should be ashamed if you love a, a child as a pedophile. You should be. Great shame on you. Seriously. You know what I'm saying? Right? So nobody believes that. Nobody believes this to its entirety. Well, of course, now, where's the line? What's right and wrong? What the culture currently says or what the Bible says? So, by the way, the man who comes out to his family as gay, true story, multiple times, multiple examples, leaves his wife and his kids for his homosexual lover, is not condemned for his unfaithfulness to his wife. He took a vow till death do we part, and he left her for a man. He's not condemned for that or for leaving his children or abandoning his kids. He's praised for being true to himself. 
And let's just say, how does that hold up in other instances? Apply that same standard to the man who leaves his wife for a much younger looking model. Most view him as a scoundrel, and rightfully so, but why isn't he being true to himself? What if he wasn't just born that way to chase other women? What are you talking about? It doesn't hold up. It doesn't. No, those are different. Why? Well, reasons. No, that doesn't work. We talked about this last week. You can feel something strongly, and you can feel it deeply down in your bones, but it doesn't make it true. And Cowboys fans know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? (laughs) Sorry, guys. Sorry, okay. What if, what if the constant schoolyard bully is like, I was born this way. For as long as I can remember, I love picking on kids. Which is true, by the way, sometimes. If you deal with children long enough. Like, for as long as I can remember, I just love taking stuff from other people. I was born this way. He was. Why can't he embrace it? Well, no, that's not, that's not one of the, you know, the letters in the alphabet there, right? Uh, the B is for bisexual, not for bullying, but maybe, maybe it could be part of that eventually. What if the schoolyard bully is like, God wants me to be happy, and this makes me happy? So you see how that response does not hold up under scrutiny. This fallen nature is clearly seen in other examples. I've used the example before, and I'll do it again. It's clearly seen in, like, toddlers. Okay? Toddlers are like cats. If they were big enough, they'd kill us. They would. Toddlers are so sweet and then randomly just slap and like, <laughs> what are you going to do about that, right? Like, you know, what are you going to do? I, I have told this story before and it's, it's, it always sticks in my mind. I remember my boys, they're twin boys, they're 19 now, um, Caleb and Brady, and uh, they, Ginger was out at the store and they were about one year old. They were standing but not yet standing on their own. And uh, I was watching them, and I was on the phone with Ginger. She was asking me about a couple things at the store. And while I'm on the phone with her, for the first time, Brady picks up a toy while he's standing, and Caleb grabbed it from him. And without batting an eye, Brady just slapped him across the face and took it. But what was so cool is without batting an eye, Caleb slapped Brady in the face and took it back. And this happened three times. And Ginger's talking to me, and I'm like, oh, this is crazy. She's like, what, what, what? I'm like, it's our boys' first fight. They're slapping each other. And she's like, you're the father. Stop them. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it was like kind of like, hey, I'm kind of proud of them, right? You know, like, but it, it, they were not, they'd never been slapped in the face. They were never taught to hit. They naturally naturally begin to well up within them when somebody took something that they wanted, they would do whatever it takes to get it back. That was not caught, right? That was not like learned behavior. They were born that way. All of us have desires for things that God has forbidden. It was perfectly natural for the boys to smack each other. They'd never seen it or been the receiving end. It flowed from their heart, but it wasn't right. This is a result of our fallen nature. Our desires, as we experience them, are not natural, okay? Um, We, all of us, because of sin, desire things that God has forbidden. It is a reflection of how sin has twisted every one of us. You and I were born this way. We were born in sin. This is why Jesus says, you must be born again. That's why that's the message of the New Testament. You were born this way. You feel things naturally that are wrong. You need to be born again. Every one of us. Not like people with sin that we don't like. Like all of us. Because all of our sin is an affront to a holy, just, and righteous God. And to ever stand before him, we must stand forgiven. And that's why Jesus came. You must be born again. You need a new life. You need new desires. This is where Jesus comes in. When When he saves you, he begins the process of changing you and shaping you. God, through the Holy Spirit, begins to transform your life. It does not mean you will never be tempted again. It does not mean you'll never struggle with sin again. But what it does mean, one of the marks of a Christian, is that you fight it. You fight it. That's one of the marks of a Christian. That's why Paul describes like the Christian life as a walk. It's very unimpressive. It's very boring. And sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. But we fight it. God, though, is promising, he's shaping us, and through the Holy Spirit, he's beginning to transform all of our lives as Christians, remaking us into the image of Jesus. We call this process sanctification. It is God growing us in the Christian life. Sometimes that growth is exciting and fun, and sometimes it's difficult as God breaks the grip of sin in our life. The good news is that what God starts at salvation, so you need to hear this, and if you've got a loved one, 
that maybe has given a testimony of salvation, but they're far from God right now. The good news is that what God starts, he finishes. And if God began a good work in you or your child who's a long way away, he will finish what he started. He promises to finish it. Ultimately, we will celebrate forever on the new heaven and the new earth with none of that sin nature, no more twisted desires of any kind. Thank you, Jesus. Okay? Last couple minutes. Last couple minutes. Let me talk about a way forward. Okay? Just a couple minutes here. And because uh, these are difficult, divisive times. How is a Christian to live in a culture that is so hostile to the truth? How are we to interact with people and a culture that believes things so fundamentally different than we do? Work and school and extended family. Then on top of that, it seems like the country is perhaps more polarized now in politics than it's been perhaps in any time since maybe the 60s and 70s. So how is a Christian to live? What are we to do? And I want to give you two ideas just to think big picture on. And then maybe we can talk about specifics. If you've got questions, we can talk about those things later. Here's the first thing. What we're going to try to do by the grace of God is we're going to try and live in peace. This is straight from Scripture. Romans chapter 12. Paul writing to a people that were under severe persecution. If possible, so far as it depends on you, Romans chapter 12, verse 18, live peaceably with all. Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is especially powerful when you consider his original audience. They were suffering intense and life-altering and life-threatening persecution. And Paul's challenge to them was, if you can, as much as possible, live at peace. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, what's interesting about that text is, if possible, acknowledges that sometimes it's not possible to live in peace. You can't live in peace with somebody who's jumped into your home for a home invasion, okay? Put a bullet in their head, okay? Seriously, all right? You can't live in peace with somebody like that, okay? Um, so, but if possible, you do that. But what, one of the things that we need to differentiate between is the big powerful lobbying and interest groups that push things like drag queen story hour and push things like uh, really sexually explicit pride parades. We need to differentiate between lobbyists and organizations like that and Joe Schmo neighbor who just wants to be happy. Okay, and we need to try to live in peace with them. And they think their pursuit of their lifestyle is going to bring them happiness. You and I can identify with that. We struggle with the exact same thing. Maybe not in the exact same way, but we struggle with the exact same thing, believing that we know better than God. And so we ought to try, as by the grace of God, to live in peace with them, to overcome evil with good, to love them, to show them the love of Christ. Your Joe Schmo neighbor wants to be happy, thinks their pursuit of that same-sex lifestyle is going to do that, thinks that, uh, you know, dressing up as a woman is going to do that for them, Okay. This would be a way to leave a distinctly Christian mark in an especially hostile and divided time, a hateful, polarized world. Find a way in the power of the Spirit to live in peace. Jesus, when he saw crowds of people full of sinners like this, he was moved with compassion because they were sheep who had no shepherd. And that's why he came as the good shepherd. So live in peace. I think largely we as Christians, and notice I say and think there, I'm giving you now like some wisdom and you're asking me like, what's a way forward? I'm not, this isn't like, thus says the Lord. I want to give you a little bit of like some pastoral wisdom, some recommendations. Okay, so there's a difference, right, between what we said like scripture, scripture clearly says and now like how do we apply this in a hostile world? How do we live in peace? Well, I think one of the things we need to do is we really need to get away from cancel culture. That's withdrawing support or canceling someone or a company after they've done or said something that's deemed offensive. And lately, like cancel culture is uh, associated with leftist snowflakes, like people say. But I want to point out that Christians have been using cancel culture tactics for as long as I've been alive. For years, I grew up in church in the 80s and 90s during the political movement of the moral majority. And part of the purpose of the moral majority was to attempt this very thing. Like you're either for us and we're the majority of people or you're against us. And you don't want to be against us because if you're against us, we've got numbers and we've got a lot of power. And we're going to cancel things like, I mean, I remember like things even like restaurants that sell alcohol. 
and like canceling Disney for like 37 different things. Uh, one, one in my church uh, was like Lee Jeans because they gave money to the gays. And I liked Lee Jeans because they had husky jeans, okay? Like uh, it's the only thing that fit me as a kid. You kids, they have no idea what it's like to go into a department store and your mom asks like the rep, like, hey, where are the husky jeans for my husky son? And then get on the PA and be like, where are the husky jeans for this sixth grade kid right here? Oh, man. But Lee Jeans had husky. We're canceling them though. And we're canceling Target over bathrooms and we're canceling Starbucks because they're commies and they took our plastic straws. And you ought to cancel Starbucks because it's six bucks just for like a fork and a napkin, but whatever. Listen, you can and should choose where to use your money and what businesses and companies to frequent. But what I'm talking about is fomenting a mob. And while the moral majority worked for a little bit, what happens when the country is growingly and increasingly less religious? And all of a sudden, that mob doesn't have the power it has anymore. And then the, the other side begins to use those same tactics. We have a long history of cancel culture on our own side. And how's that worked out? It's failed miserably. It's perfectly fine to choose where you'll spend your money. But organizing a posse doesn't work. The way forward is not to return evil for evil. The way forward is to be the best customers, to be the kindest, to tip the best. Oh, like that people know there's something different about you. Like they, they see you and they recognize you. Like, oh man, there's some Christians after church and, and you know, here's an obvious uh, strong LGBT supporter and they're expecting a terrible tip. And they ought to get the best tip because you love them because they're an image bearer. Like that's living in peace, okay? That's a Christian distinctive. How can I live in peace? And one quick one here just to open this can a little bit and then just walk away. That'll be fun. Um, so like... <laughs> What about with your trans friend? I think you should call them by their name. You should call, they change their names. Well, many names are often androgynous in the US. People have a right to decide whatever they should be called by. Call them by their name. I do not believe, again, I'm not telling you this is what the Bible, I'm telling you, I do not believe though that you should use their preferred pronouns. Uh, the reason for that is referring to a man as a she denies biological reality. It also does not love them to help them in their delusion, okay? So if you're asking me, what should I do, Jason? I would say call them by their name, but try to find ways to avoid pronouns altogether. And right, if we're going to, why, why are we even stopping at pronouns? I got some adverbs and adjectives I would love people to say about me, and why can't those things be preferred, right? Of course, it's ridiculous. So names, but not pronouns, because pronouns deny biological uh, reality. Pronouns become the sort of like compelled speech. That would be my recommendation. But live in peace. Let's find ways to live in peace. We can do that. It was much harder in first century Rome. And Paul called Christians the same thing. Here's the last thing and we're done quickly here. Less social media and more face to face. And by that I mean like, we're not gonna tackle these issues on social media. And quite frankly, like social media, when we use it as like a, a hammer to destroy the other side, it's killing us. It's destroying our Christian witness part of a very large Facebook group of pastors, and I'm really just a lurker on that group, but it's a recurring concern raised by most all pastors that our people interact so much in the virtual world, and so much of that interaction is antagonistic, and the person is dis detached from the account. That's the problem with social media in general. We're not meeting people face to face. We're just seeing like another avatar. We're just seeing another account that's rivaling ours. So because there's this detachment from in-person interaction, we say things we would never say in person. We are mean, we are cruel, we are awful, and the distance that social media provides is destructive for teens and for adults alike. It robs us of joy. It robs us of strength to then have real conversations with somebody across the fence. We have no time or energy for real people because somebody's wrong on the internet. And it's my job, I got a badge, I'm the person that fixes everybody on the internet. Meantime, you got a neighbor who you could have a good discussion with or a real discussion with. But we got no energy for that. We got no time for that because our time and energy is spent in the virtual world and it's killing us. Look, we as a people were in serious trouble. Numbers from last year, 25% of Americans, 18 to 24, in a 30-day period considered suicide. 16% ages 25 to 44. There is a lot of despair and there's a lot of pain. And all we're doing on social media is encouraging it. 
and posting vengeful and hateful stuff that mocks and derides half the country. Like social media highlights the worst events and it highlights the most extreme cases and the worst people through viral videos and you begin to think that everyone who thinks differently than me is the exact same way. And we grow in our disgust and we begin to at least think like they're not even people. They're like animals. And they can be treated that way. Yet we've been called to something much different. One of our responsibilities is trying to tell other people about Jesus. And it's hard to tell people about Jesus when you openly despise them. Okay? And, our po- and we post our disgust about them and their ilk on social media. Behind this homosexuality, behind the trans issue, behind the politics are real people. People that Jesus loves intensely. Image bearers who don't know what forgiveness looks like who don't know what mercy looks like. And maybe God has placed you in their path to show them those things. 1 Peter chapter 3 gives us this great challenge. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. Do it with gentleness and respect. I mean, that's a word again, to persecuted Christians, but he assumes that people will ask you about the hope within. You're different. You have hope. You treat people differently, even though they completely disagree with you. What is different about you? Maybe it's been a long time since somebody's asked you about the hope within, because you and I mostly live like we don't have any hope. We mostly live like the rest of the pagans around us. Less social media, more face-to-face with real people, people that Jesus died for, let's look them in in the face, let's look them in the eyes, and tell them about the God-man from Galilee. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, and we confess, Lord, as a people, that there are times, just like all the examples in scripture today, that we know what you say, and we're like, ah, we're just going to do it differently anyways. We confess that arrogance. We confess that pride. We confess it as sin. Forgive us, Lord, and And thank you for your mercy and your long-suffering nature. But I pray for somebody here that doesn't know Christ today, that that today would be the day of their salvation. And I pray for Christians here that are struggling with how to to walk and how to interact, that you would give them grace to to live in peace, they would look for opportunities to to show the hope, to tell of the hope that is within. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. So the instruments are going to play, and here's your time to speak with God. And maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. And your prayer is, Father, be merciful to me, a Savior. Save me. Maybe you're here as a Christian. You have some things to confess, a spirit of ugliness. Maybe you yourself, you're recognizing some of the ways you're living differently than God has called you to. Confess those things today. Receive that forgiveness full and free. Instruments play. Here's your time to speak.